Hello and welcome to the Gamers Tavern. This week we're going to the archive for a recording that's about a full year old. Uh, Ross talks about going to Genghis Khan on the previous weekend during the recording and, well, he went to the following Genghis Khan last weekend. So, yeah, it's, this one's been gathering dust in the closet for a while. This episode has guests Richard Baker and John Dunn talking about sword and sorcery games. Speaking of, there's a Kickstarter going on right now for Robert E. Howard's Conan role-playing game with several former guests involved, including Timothy Brown, Jesse Scoble, Mark Carroll, Jennifer Bowman, and a lot of other award-winning game designers and some of the premier scholars of Howard's work to ensure authenticity. It's running until March 20th, 2016, so if you'd like to get involved... Go ahead and check out the show notes for the link to the Kickstarter. And we're also in the final week of Aaron Alston's Strike Force Kickstarter, updated from Aaron's notes by Ross Watson, Michael Sherbrooke, Steve Kinson, Sean Patrick Fannin, and more. That one's running until March 1st, 2016, and has just a couple more stretch goals to knock out in this final week. With that said, grab a drink from the bar and take a seat at the table in the corner, and we'll be right back after this word from our sponsor. Geek and Gamer Gear is a new store out there for gaming and anime jewelry and memorabilia. They've already got a huge selection of quality items at bargain basement prices, and they're adding new products all the time. If you use the coupon code TAVERN, you get an additional 10% off their already low prices. So go to geekingamergear.com to find the perfect Pokemon plushie, Legend of Zelda necklace, companion cube earrings, or a whole lot more. That's geek, the letter N, GamerGear.com And don't forget that coupon code TAVERN for 10% off every single order. Welcome to Gamers Tavern Podcast. I'm your host, Ross Watson. And I'm Daryl Mudd. And tonight we have with us two great friends of mine, great game designers, and both former guests of the show coming back for a repeat performance, Richard Baker and John Dunn. Hi, everybody. Hi, guys. Thanks for the opportunity. Man, it is great having you guys come back onto the show. I love it when we have guests that are willing to join us again <laughs> on our little show here because I know sometimes we get into some pretty interesting conversations. And of course, uh, you know, John and I are good friends working on a bunch of stuff together. Uh, Richard Baker is one of my favorite designers. It's it's one of the great things about this show that I get to bring people like y'all on you all. See, that's my, my <laughs> that's my Texas right there. Like you all onto the show again. And it's uh, a pleasure to be here. So, Daryl, what are we talking about tonight? Uh, tonight, our topic is sword and sorcery. That's right. As a genre, swords and sorcery which is uh, kind of interesting. I think this is the first time we're actually tackling – no, the second time after Cyberpunk, isn't it? I believe so. No, we, did, yes. we also did Mecha, didn't we? Uh, I, I, I suppose. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if that was a technically a genre show or not. Let's The listeners should weigh in and tell us if they thought that was a genre <laughs> show or not. Oh, God. Semantics arguments everywhere in the comments. I'm counting Cyberpunk and I'm counting this one as our second genre episode. <laughs> All right, so before we jump into this full full hog, we're going to do our normal thing, which is we have our guest and we have them tell us about themselves or tell the listeners about themselves in the form of a gaming character sheet. And why don't we start with you, Richard? Um, okay. I've been in the business for, uh, gosh, since 1991. So I think that makes me a 24th level game designer. <laughs> uh, figure one year per level. level. <laughs> I am a... Uh, former wizard, as in I spent a lot of years at Wizards of the Coast and TSR before that, so I think that makes my, my character class wizard. Oh, yeah. Uh, although these days I'm, I'm, I'm off doing my own thing with uh, Sasquatch Game Studio. So call me uh, a 21st level wizard who then took three levels of Sasquatch. So you're a hairy wizard. Yes, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, brilliant. And if you don't mind, as part of your gaming character sheet, uh, what are some of the highlights of the things that you've worked on that pe- that our listeners know you from? I'm one of the uh, big five who worked on third edition D&D. Uh, in fact, my name's in the front of every third edition D&D product. Um, every, I did a ton one. of work. Uh, what's that? Every single one. Uh, yeah, just, well, uh, the you know, the based on the third edition rules by... 
Oh, wow. Uh, you know, Monty Cook and Jonathan Tweet, Skip Williams, Richard Baker, and Peter Atkinson. That is badass. So, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm actually pretty pretty excited about that. that that's, a, that's a good, you know, feather to stick in your cap. <laughs> More recently, um, let me see, I did a fair amount of work, 4th edition era D&D things. I did the 4th edition uh, Dark Sun setting. Um, I did the Gamma World box set that came out just a couple of years ago, uh, which is uh, uh, a lot of fun. I worked on that with Bruce Cordell and was very zany and entertaining. Uh, the designer of the Conquest of Narath board game, um, Axis and Allies miniatures, Axis and Allies uh, naval miniatures. Um, mm, well, if I, just, if, if I may throw a couple in here, uh, you know, he's you're well known as the designer of one of my favorite settings, Birthright. Thank you. Along with Colin McComb and, of yep. course, Ed Stark and Carrie Bebris. Uh, let's see. You were also one of the big names that dealt with the fourth edition Forgotten Realms. Yes. I third, did, third uh, I did work as a creative director for, for Forgotten Realms for a number of years. So I oversaw the uh, third edition Forgotten Realms and fourth edition Forgotten Realms. And a few uh, novels under your belt, too. Uh, yes. I, I wrote uh, one of the uh, books of the uh, uh, War of the Spider Queen series. I uh, did the uh, Blades of the Moon Sea uh, trilogy in the fourth edition Arrow Realms. City of Ravens. I, uh, yeah, City of Ravens and a sequel on ebook called Prince of Ravens. Both of them are good. You should check them out, listeners. Uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, what else? I did uh, the Last Mythal Trilogy for Forgotten Realms, which is a big, epic uh, elf battle series. And more recently, uh, my partners and I at Sasquatch worked on the Primeval Thule campaign setting, uh, which uh, should be hitting your friendly local gaming store uh, for a little bit lucky next month. Which is bringing us right back to our topic because Primeval Thule is very, very influenced by the sword and sorcery genre. Wouldn't you agree? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it, it's, it is. My whole idea with Primeval Thule is simply to try and capture some of the, the sort of blend of fantasy and horror that you found in a lot of uh, Robert Howard's stories. There are many, many Conan stories that uh, take a strong, hard tilt towards the Cthulhu mythos. And I was always very interested in those. I wanted to really kind of dive into a world that had a Conan vibe that was really dripping with uh, Great Old One's goodness. And uh, that's kind of where the Primeval Thule uh, idea came from. That We, we kind of laugh. We say, if you had to come up with the elevator pitch for Primeval Thule, it's simply Conan versus Cthulhu. <laughs> and <laughs> That's good. Know, that's else? a good elevator pitch. And yeah. it actually bridges us right over to our second guest, John Dunn. John Dunn. What is your gaming character sheet like? Well, after hearing Riches, I'm pretty sure I'm that minor NPC that died before he got to the dungeon. <laughs> <laughs> He's a hard act to follow. He really is. Um, so my name's John Dunn. I'm uh, actually a part-time game designer. I've been playing for uh, a frightening number of years, but uh, I've only been actively freelancing for I don't know, eight or nine years. Uh, I did a fair bit of work on Shadowrun with Catalyst uh, during the 4th edition era uh, and during the time when that moved into uh, 20th anniversary edition. And then I did a bit of work with Fantasy Flight on all the different Warhammer 40,000 roleplay lines, uh, including Dark Heresy, Death Watch, and the rest of that lot. I've also worked with Fantasy Flight on their Star Wars line, uh, working on Edge of the Empire Age of Rebellion, and Force and Destiny on the core books as well as a number of expansions for them. Done a little bit of work on Pinnacle, a bit with Weird on Through the Breach, and probably a few other minor things that I'm forgetting. Uh, the most significant, of course, being I'm the publisher, owner of Meliorvia, which is the company that publishes Accursed. Which yeah. We've worked with Ross and Jason Marker on that to develop both the Kickstarter and then the final product. And from Accursed, we get to a little piece of Primeval Thule as well. Uh, exactly. After Rich was kind enough to help us out with Kickstarter, we uh, did a little adventure that hopefully they'll be getting out the door sometime not too distant future. Well, that's it was a trade for Rich's adventure for Accursed, which is, of course, the Banshee of Loch Fenir, uh, which has some really good reviews on Drive Through RPG. I'm very uh, pleased. Uh, in case you didn't know about that. Uh, Richard. <laughs> I know. I, I, I've seen the, seen the reviews. It's, it's pretty awesome. <laughs> All right. So Mutual Appreciation Society uh, is over. Let's talk about what we've been playing lately. 
I'm going to start with Daryl. What have you been playing lately? I spent a sleepless Saturday playing Skyrim for the first time. Whoa! I know. I actually played a video game that was made in this century. It's shocking. But yeah, I played uh, Skyrim for about 16 hours straight because it was one more it's mission. It's immersive. Just one more mission. Just one more mission. Then I got stuck on, okay, it's four in the morning. One more mission. At nine o'clock, I threw the controller in the air and just, fuck this, I'm done. Because <laughs> I got stuck on a Diplomatic Immunity, which if you played the game, you're probably familiar with that one. And oh, yeah. I'm playing uh, an orc with big two-handed weapon on what's primarily a sneaky kind of thing. And it did not end well for me many, many, many times until I just got frustrated and said, okay, I might want to try to start over about three hours ago in gameplay and try again. <laughs> Because I was just making a beeline for my Fus Roda. I wanted that <laughs> tall dragon shout, so I was like, let's do all the quest missions to get that, then I'll do all the side stuff. No, I, need, I, need a, I need a couple lo- levels under me before I try that again. Skyrim is pretty special. I'm actually really excited to hear you say that you're playing it. Uh, what else are you into? Uh, that's about it, gaming-wise. Because uh, 16 hours to your eyes bleed playing one game, I figure, is enough for a week. Okay. Uh, so Daryl, that's what you've been playing lately. I'm going to go to John. John, what have you been playing lately? Well, I have a seven-year-old daughter, so I've been playing a frightening amount of Skylanders. As the <laughs> <computer team. laughs> um, tabletop, last night, our normal Monday night RPG session wasn't able to get together, so we actually played the XCOM board game from mm-hmm. Fantasy Flight. I had not played that before, and I thought that was pretty awesome. It did a really good job of capturing the feel of the computer game. Um, uh, particularly in that on the easy setting, it was really a little futile, um, but a lot of fun doing it. Um, that does sound pretty sweet. Uh, yeah, the, they do a neat job of uh, integrating the iPad app into the game so that you really have no idea what's coming and turn sequence can change from turn to turn. It's pretty pretty cool set of elements there. I heard a lot of good things about it. Uh, and then our normal RPG, which, like I said, we missed this past Monday, is a supers campaign in a homegrown setting. We're using the old Mayfair DC Heroes system and uh, playing some pretty high-level characters that a good buddy of mine uh, designed the setting. And we're defending the Earth from uh, invasions from parallel worlds. It's been, been a good time. You, sir, win the Old School Gaming Award. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, sometimes I just never want to catch up to what's going <laughs> <laughs> all right thank you john uh let's talk to richard richard what have you been playing lately in terms of uh electronic games uh, i'm a i'm a huge uh, civilization fan uh so i've been uh i'm i'm still playing the heck out of civilization beyond earth and liking that pretty well rpg uh wise myself the other sasquatches and a couple of good buddies uh spent a lot of time over uh the last six months Playing in the Temple of Elemental Evil, we uh, Sasquatch Game Studio uh, were the design outfit that uh, is putting together uh, the new uh, Elemental Evil Adventures for Wizards of the Coast, oh. uh, which should be coming out next month. So we were obviously kind of playtesting our own material as we were going along and uh, having a lot of fun uh, uh, figuring out what was uh, good, bad, and indifferent about the uh, adventure we were working on. I am that is cool. So looking forward to that. I Temple of Elemental Evil has always been one of my favorite, like big super adventure campaign style things. So I've been dying to get my hands on this since it was announced. <laughs> now, what well, a lot of listeners, we, we, we hope it, I, I hope it measures up. What a lot, a lot of listeners may not know about Richard is besides writing novels, creating campaign settings, and working on uh, you know uh, brand new game systems, he's actually a really, really good adventure designer too, and has a lot of examples in Dungeon Magazine and one of my favorite adventures uh for dungeons dragons of course the red hand of doom for oh, third awesome. edition so yeah if richard says he's writing an adventure i'm going to pay attention <laughs> <laughs> well thank you <clears throat> no not to mention of course uh banshee block veneer so <laughs> uh cool so you've been you've been working on uh, temple of elemental evil and playing civilization anything else uh that's the big stuff uh, I, I mean my daughter uh i have a 16 year old daughter and uh, she is a huge warcraft fan and with the latest, you know, update, I I, you know, I I found myself kind of drawn back into it. So I've been uh, slowly leveling my my character up again, and just kind of admiring the 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 new zones, you know, uh-huh. because you know, yeah, say what you know, Blizzard puts together some some really beautiful new uh, zones to explore when they when they release a big expansion. It's it's always worth seeing. 
Super cool. Yeah. All right. I'm going to tell you guys about what I've been playing lately. Recently, we had Genghis Khan here in Aurora, Colorado. And Genghis is one of my favorite conventions just because it is like all gaming all the time. And there are just amazing GMs uh, at Genghis Khan. Whenever they put up the list of you know when, it's, when you're available to sign up for different games – I am there as quickly as I possibly can because there's always a rush on different games because everybody knows, you know, uh, Ron Rigabach is a fantastic GM. Everybody knows that Robert Dorff is a fantastic GM. So when his games go up, you have to get in them fast <laughs> if you can. And uh, just really quick, I ran uh, three games there. Of course, I ran a Cursed. I ran a fifth edition D&D cartoon adventure based on the 1981-1983 Dungeons & Dragons cartoon. <laughs> that was awesome. Oh my god, it was so much fun. Sounds they, fantastic. They fought Venger twice. They gave up a chance to go home. They learned a valuable lesson. Everybody had a wonderful time. I was really, really happy with it. Uh, possibly the best part about it was I would tell them, you know, we're doing this like the cartoon, and most of them had actually seen it. So the guy playing Presto was coming up with rhymes for his hats, and then when I said Dungeon Master walks out from behind a tree, they all at the same time said, Dungeon Master! Like, <laughs> three tables away are looking over at me. Like, What's going on over there? Um, I also played in, of course, Bill Key's fantastic uh, steampunk game, The Wedding Gyre. I got to play in uh, Robert Dorff's Luchador game, which is always a blast. I got to play Colonel Steve Austin in another 70s operatives game. And uh, possibly the most fun I had was Jake Burgess, who's been on the show before, had a Transformers game based on the 1980s cartoon. And the characters included Jazz, Optimus Prime, Mirage, Hound, and Bumblebee fighting Megatron and the Constructicons. It was badass. I just – I don't know how else to tell you. <laughs> so yeah, that's Genghis Khan. You guys definitely should try and go. Anybody who's listening, if you can, get yourself to Aurora in February. It is an amazing, amazing con. All right. So let's uh, skip on down to Tavern Tales. This is where we ask our guests to provide us with a, a story of a really memorable die roll from a particular game. And since, you know, we're doing Sword and Sorcery tonight, I'm going to ask if you can think of one relatable. Those don't have to be, like, necessarily Sword and Sorcery, but if you can find a way to relate it to it, that would be awesome. So I'm going to start with John. Can you give us a tavern tale? Oh, I'm sure I can come up with something. So one of my friends has disastrous luck with dice. <laughs> I know many people categorize themselves with that, but I... He's, he's kind of special in this regard. And uh, I recall one particular game session. We were playing a game called Rollmaster. Oh. Yes. And he was playing a mage. And when playing in Rollmaster, if you roll badly, there are consequences. And series of bad rolls can make things worse. Um, and we were had kind of a you know, minor encounter where we were battling some undead and he was a spellcaster. And he rolled a zero two on percentile dice. Now in Rollmaster you don't just when you're rolling percentile dice, if you roll in the extremes, you roll again and subtract or roll again and add. And he backed it with a ninety nine <laughs> and then backed Ooh. it with a ninety seven <laughs> and then backed it with like a sixty something. Which meant that there's a chart for that, because in Rollmaster, there's always a chart for that. <laughs> and it meant that not only did the spell disastrously fail, it also meant that the spellcaster exploded in a <laughs> spectacular fashion. And I was um, about to make a spontaneous human combustion joke, too. Yeah, that's exactly where it went. So the good news was that we did end up defeating the undead that we were battling at the time. <laughs> But we lost four party members. Oh, my God. Not from the undead. Well, casting spells in Rollmaster is more art than science. This one definitely was <laughs> not very artistic. <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. Thank you, John. All right. Uh, Richard, what about you? Well, you know, I'm in kind of rack of my head. And, and, and this is going to sound crazy because I know most gamers are, are you know, extremely conscious about, you know, great roles and and – or bad dice luck or whatever. And and I, I really do kind of view it in a lot of ways as a as a a random number generator. I, I kinda of don't put a lot of uh, a lot of stock in 
you know, a, a great role at the right time, or at least I, I have a hard time thinking of a good story with one. You know what? Uh, That's okay. You, just, you know, yeah. I mean, a, a, a funny miscellaneous story I'll point out is as a DM, I pulled off a TPK once because early in third edition, I created a version of Return to the Tomb of Horrors, uh, which I had customized with all new third edition rules and mechanics because I wanted to use the, the that great, great adventure by Bruce Cordell as sort of the test bed for my third edition campaign. And uh, the party at one point uh, was trying to track down a, a one of the, a number of servitor liches to a Sarawak that I had added to the adventure because I knew they all knew the adventure pretty well. And I, I went to some great lengths to kind of customize it for them. And at one point, the party decided, well, we know this guy's name. Let's just conjure up, you know, Ariel Servant and we'll send it to go fetch this guy and bring him to where we are so we don't have to try and guess. And we'll just pull him when he gets here. So they send off an aerial servant to go retrieve this 20th level lich. <laughs> and then, you know, just like I said, now let's go out in the town. You know, we'll, we'll go to the bar. We'll have a few drinks. It's going to take him a while. We'll go back home. We'll go to sleep. Whatever. He's off getting this guy. And, you know, essentially <laughs> wound up totally forgetting they had sent the aerial servant out to go get a 20th level of lich and bring him back. <laughs> so, <laughs> That can't have any negative consequences. Right. And so, like, you know, eight hours later, the aerial servant comes back and drops a really pissed off witch <laughs> right smack in the middle of the party when, like, they're three quarters asleep. You know, like, only one of them's kind of on watch, and he's like, and of course, that, that lich has had all oh, about four hours of flight time to think about what am I going to do when I get there? <laughs> <laughs> oh, so, God. Oh, yeah, so the very first thing, of course, the Earl Sermon doesn't subdue the guy and drop him. He just says, oh, get easier, bang, just drops him out in front of the party. And the lich, you know, the very first thing happens is like the old uh, uh, death fog spell, the one that's like <laughs> solid fog but just filled with acid damage. You know, gloms up the whole party and that stuff, and nobody can move. And at that point, the lich says, huh, now I can't see anybody, so I guess I'm just going to start throwing horrid wilting spells right into the middle of there, and, you know, if they're in there, great, you know? And, and so... Yeah, it was bad. Like, you know, half the party dead. And the and the part was, it's funny, it just amazed me. It, it didn't re- occur to anybody to, you know, realize at some point, you know, maybe we should have been on our toes once we sent the guy to go get the lich and bring him here. <laughs> you know, just, and they knew he was a lich all along. Wow. God. Yeah. That's, so, that's, there you that's go. Crazy. Players right. are funny. That is a good story. But let's jump into the main topic tonight. And I think I think the first question that needs to be asked is what is – Sword and sorcery, and we're talking about the genre. I'll tell you, I learned something kind of funny about this because I started looking real hard at what good sword and sorcery games and, and good sword and sorcery adventures contained when I, you know, we were kind of gearing up to work on Thule. And I was astonished that people are extremely snobby about sword and sorcery. Really? Yes, that the people out there who are real sword and sorcery fans would, you know, say, you know what, D&D, not sword and sorcery. And, and I, I kind of scratched my head at that and I said, wow, really? But it turns out that sword and sorcery, some of the characteristics they expect are it should be a low magic setting or uh, it it should be very humanocentric. The characters should be not necessarily heroes, a more a mix of, of mercenaries and antiheroes. But that's kind of what some of the things that are that are really, uh, you know, put something dead center in sword and sorcery as opposed to just miscellaneous fantasy role playing. Well, I like to think of certain sorcery as is kind of like a dial, right? And there's different settings on that dial. There's the Fritz Lieber setting. There's the Elric setting. There's the Conan setting, right? And those are different. There's a different points along the the sort of track for sword and sorcery because they're all sword and sorcery. They're just different flavors of it, right? What about you, John? Do you, what would you say if someone asked you what is sword and sorcery as a genre? Oh, absolutely. I just start with start and end with Conan. I'm actually really kind of surprised. I never would have considered Elric sword and sorcery intuitively. Uh, to me, if you're looking at a game, Iron Heroes is the definitive sword and sorcery RPG in my mind. On Mighty Thews is another really good example in my opinion, but we'll get to that. So we're talking about Conan. Like I think Conan is is possibly the most well known example of sword and sorcery. But uh, just before we get away from this whole definition bit, um, Daryl. We, are you really familiar with sword and sorcery as a genre? Like, are you like have you read a lot of Conan or, or no, Lieber or any of that stuff? I honestly haven't. Uh, it's kind of a genre that always feels like it's not quite my thing. 
So I've kind of avoided it for the most part. So I'm really, really lacking on a lot of knowledge other than I've seen both of the Conan movies and I've <laughs> seen, seen Crawl and uh, I watched half a Beastmaster before I fell asleep. But well, let's let's be clear. There's only one Conan movie and it came out in 1983. Uh, all right. <clears throat> well, I was talking about the, the direct sequel to that one. Film snobbery. <laughs> yeah, there is. OK, fair enough. There is a sequel to that one. All right. So film snobbery aside, uh, Rich, maybe you can help me out. What are some differences that separate sword and sorcery, aside from things you already mentioned, um, from things like epic and high fantasy? Uh, well, I think the idea that uh, um, magic is something that is is should definitely not be widespread, right? That epic fantasy, uh, high fantasy, um, you would kind of assume that you know any any army would of course have a a magical artillery unit, right? And and sword and sorcery, no, the the spellcaster should be pretty rare. Right. So, so when we're saying magic, we're primarily talking about spells and or magic items that are kind of like technology kind of a thing. Right. That, that mag- Yeah, right. Exactly. Right. That, that magic as technology is definitely not part of sword and sorcery that that the heroes would never, you know. Yeah, maybe you could get away with like a magical elevator platform in a dungeon, for example. But you, you certainly wouldn't want to see things uh, like, you know, you know, whatever. It's uh, uh, so it's, it's definitely low magic, um, which. Uh, for us, with Primeval Thule presents a real challenge uh, in that uh, the D and D systems that we designed Thule for uh, are not necessarily low magic systems. So we need to kind of uh, we need to define a way to, to let people know. Okay, here's how you can play essentially a, a Pathfinder game or a Fourth Edition D and D game in uh, in a sword and sorcery setting, and, and not really you know fly in the face of, of what the the world expectations are. Well, what are some examples of magic you would encounter in certain sorcery? I imagine we're talking about curses and we're talking about like divinations, but we're not really getting into things like fireballs. Well, I think it's okay if it's in the hands of of bad guys, right? If, if you know, Conan spends a fair amount of time going up against evil wizards, okay, and evil wizards can do things like conjure demons and yeah, cast was- you know mind blotting enchantments, and they're not likely to blast you with a lightning bolt per se. But there's so many. We'll do you know lots of other things like, you know, with Thulsa Doom, you know, throw a fireball. No, we could Thulsa Doom summon a a a cloud of poisonous mist. Sure, I'd buy that. All right, it's just you know, it's it, <laughs> it's in the you know, it's it's not quite as flashy, but it, it it can still be there. I think steel isn't strong, boy. Flesh, flesh is strong. <laughs> One thing I've always I found kind of ironic when I was doing the research is that every definition of how magic isn't as big of a deal. It's all low magic settings is giving descriptions that almost perfectly describe the way in Lord of the Rings magic is presented as, as opposed to aside from Sauron and there's magic in the world because there's elves and halflings and everything and hobbits and everything else. There's not much actual overt magic. Gandalf doesn't run around throwing lightning bolts and fireballs everywhere. For well, example, it, it depends but again on, on Lord the, of the Rings the is by no way, shape, or form sword and sorcery. Well, I was going to say, even, even if you look at the classic sword and sorcery settings, right, if you turn that dial over to Fritz Lieber, there's a heck of a lot of magic in right. Fritz Lieber. I mean, there's invisible dudes. One of the main characters is a spellcaster who, you know, uses magic on a, on a fairly regular basis. So, you know, I mean, uh, you know, low magic, I think, is a pretty broad definition. When it comes to sword and sorcery, what do you think, John? I don't think the magic has to be low, as in weak, but I do think it has to be wild and uncontrollable, even for those who are potent with it. That at any instance, the magic can turn against them just as easily as they could control it. I think there needs to be that element of risk and that element of corruption inherent so in it. So it's not casual. No, right. it's rare. Not. It doesn't come up very often in in the world. It, it, it might not be rare at your table because your table might include a spellcaster PC, but the spellcaster PC is going to be a pretty unique person in the world just because he's somebody who knows something about magic. Well, that would definitely encompass someone like the Grey Master, for example. Exactly. So we've been using a lot of fiction <laughs> to kind of back up what we're talking about. Um, well, let's let's list off some of the, the fiction that is like the core of what sword and sorcery 
is. And I think we've already hit a few of the highlights. So Conan, um, Faffer and the Gray Mouse are all of the, the, the books by Fritz Lieber. Uh, Elric is the one I put out there, and I think I surprised – John with that, but I, I feel like Elric is sword and sorcery. One thing I felt, found was kind of cool is Fritz Lieber actually coined the phrase sword and sorcery to describe the genre. He was describing what he was writing and the works that influenced him. He was the first person to use that term. Right. Uh, in comic books, you got Red Sonia and Claw the Unconquered. Those are both uh, pretty yeah. solid sword and sorcery. I think there's actually a lot of Edgar Rice Burroughs stories oh, that yeah. fit very well in the genre. The Tarzan? Yeah, some of the Tarzan stories are very definitely getting over into there. Uh, one of the things that certainly influenced us a lot with Primeval Fool was uh, uh, the Pellucidar stories. Oh, yeah. Uh, right, the idea of the lost world populated by, you know, prehistoric animals. Uh, we leaned on Pellucidar pretty heavily in a lot of spots for Thule. Interesting. What about you, John? You got anything you want to chip in on this one? You guys have done a pretty solid job of covering the stuff with which I'm familiar already. Well, I'm going to throw one more out there and see what you guys think. I'm actually going to posit this here. Here's my my theory. Solomon Kane is actually sword and sorcery. Yeah, absolutely. Sure. It's, despite the fact that there's rifles and gunpowder and stuff like that. <laughs> uh, but it fits that genre. Uh, another? another example that just uh, struck me, uh, and this is another one that was very influential in Primeval Fool, was uh, – some of Clark Ashton Smith's uh, Hyperborea stories. Oh, of course. Yeah. Or Zothique stories. Um, uh, Ashton, you know, Clark Ashton Smith is a guy who's thought of as a mythos writer, and his his his, his fantastic stories tend to have a very kind of dark humor to them. Mm-hmm. But yeah, you know, the world that they're describing, I think, is is very much a world like uh, like the world uh, uh, the Conan stories. Well, let's talk about that really quick. I, mean, I think you, you brought this up when you were talking about Primeval Thule. But there is a solid, in my opinion, there's a very solid and traceable link between classic sword and sorcery and Cthulhu and the Cthulhu mythos. And, of course, one of those being Robert E. Howard and H.P. Uh, Lovecraft being contemporaries and friends. So Conan you know, would sometimes reference things from H.P. Lovecraft stories, for example. And I, if I'm not mistaken, there's actually – uh, some of that influence in Lankamar as well. Some of the later Lankamar books uh, make mention of uh, Cthulhu creatures. So there's definitely a link there. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, you pick, you oh, pick, I'm sorry. As you can see, I have a dog at home. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you pick up any of the, the, the Marvel Red Sonia comics, and you can also see that there's a fairly strong, uh, you know, there's a lot of cultists and, you know, uh, crazy tentacle monsters uh, from beyond and things like that. Claw the Unconquered dealt with this kind of thing as well. Uh, of course, there's Cull, uh, and Cull being basically Conan. <laughs> right. <laughs> I had two ones name. that are a little bit out there. I wanted to throw out and see what you guys thought. Okay. Uh, one is uh, another Edgar Rice Burroughs, John Carter of Mars, in a way, if you kind of cross sword and sorcery with, say, space opera of the era. Oh, huh. yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's, su- that's surprising. I, I think I would probably disagree with that but if 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 if, if richard says it is i think I'll, <laughs> I'll i'll go ahead and 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 say all right john what's your opinion on john carter uh, i would have always called that a planetary romance uh to me that's kind of the definitive yeah that's where i fall on that too <laughs> one that uh did just pop into my head that you guys hadn't mentioned was uh, the thieves world anthology that was gonna uh, be my Aspera second one to, sure i think those are very strong in that, that theme that's kind of the I was wondering if that one maybe got, went a little bit too far over the line in darkness to go into dark fantasy as opposed to sword and sorcery. So I, you know, I, I think was... I'd say it's an edge case when it comes to uh, when it comes to that. I, I would say it's one of those. It's on the Venn diagram. that's like right in between two things. What do you think, Richard? Thieves World. I, I think I I think I give it to you because uh, Thieves World to me just feels it feels a lot like uh, like Yeah, you know, I, I I don't. I don't see a whole lot of daylight between Thieves World and Light Bar. So maybe this whole like, you know, yeah. sword and sorcery people are picky thing. Maybe there's something to that. I, can, <laughs> I, started out, I started out going, well, I don't know if I understand that. Now I'm the one who's saying, you know, I'm not really sure that that is or isn't. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, OK, that's cool. I, I don't want to be a snob about it. I think, I, I think I just, a I just, genre can be really broad. So. I just wanted to kind of push some of the bouncy. I, I read some people mention those things online. I'm like. I don't s- quite see it, but maybe. And let me ask the expert, experts and see what they say. Ha. Well, that's why we have the show, so we can get experts on so the, to oh, correct, yeah. correct our, our misperceptions. <laughs> All right. 
So we've talked about some of the fiction. What you know from that fiction and, and from the, the the genre that as it stands because it's evolved over time. What are the what are the themes and tropes that you would really look for in a sword and sorcery uh, adventure or setting? Well, one of the things that that I felt was pretty important, uh, and once again, uh, I'm I'm going to keep beating the primeval fool drum. <laughs> but, uh, Go right ahead. Uh, we wanted to kind of uh, catch the idea that uh, character motivations aren't uh, necessarily altruistic. That sword and sorcery very often lean, lends itself to characters who are very uh, uh, mercenary, characters who are morally uh, right. characters who are self motivated, characters who are searching for the big score. Um, Right, so it's not like uh, you self-interest know, over heroism, maybe. Yeah, exactly, and and it when they wind up doing heroic things, uh, and you see this all over the place in different Conan stories. You can usually count on Conan to do the right thing before the story's over, but it's not because that's what he set out to do, right? It usually, you know, in a lot of his stories, it's like, well, I'm heading off to go pillage the temple of whatever to get to this, and along the way. I wind up having to fight and kill, you know, the leader of this horrible cult. <laughs> Well, there's yeah, because otherwise that guy was probably going to kill me, or that was a guy standing between me and the prize, right? So there's there's a lot of uh, adventures that that are kind of started by the characters get their eyes on a prize and and decide to go after it, usually for very mercenary reasons. Mm. Which I think might be the dividing line between uh, sword and sorcery and heroic fantasy. Heroic fantasy, they're still kind of the good guys, even if they're still that low level, low magic kind of thing. But well, there's like, again, it's pretty broad. Again, it's broad, broad genre. Like, you know, you could say and lots of overlaps. You, you can say that some characters are ambiguously heroic and you can say other characters are pretty gosh darn heroic. I mean, you go, it back, just depends. To, you go back to the iconic character Conan. The two most famous quotes from him are not things a good guy normally says. What is the <laughs> what is best in the world? Yeah. Yeah. What is best in life? <laughs> or what is best in life? Sorry. I only saw it once. About, uh, I've seen it twice. And last time was about two years ago. So. Uh, yeah, I'm bad, and I, I need to rewatch them. <laughs> um, you should contemplate this on the tree of woe. <laughs> <There you go. laughs> uh, not with my back, no. Okay. All right, so I, I'm going to throw one out there. I think one that's that's quite common is that wealth and power corrupts. If you have a culture that is wealthy and powerful, if you have a individuals or sometimes nations very very often the 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 nations that are the most powerful the most wealthy uh, are typically the most corrupt decadent you know they have they have they've lost their way i think that's something that is a, a theme that's often uh covered yeah that, that's certainly something that we played around with a lot was the idea that that civilization was decadent right cities are wicked places and wicked people live in cities <laughs> When we when we get to talking about things like on Mighty Thews, that's going to be very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so, what about uh, what about you, John? Have you got another theme or a trope you want to point out there? Uh, the big thing that always strikes me is I, I mentioned it before, but just coming back to magic is dangerous, corrupting, uncontrollable, and evil. Um, that you know, no matter what your intentions are when you set out to deal with it, there are going to be dark consequences for it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I wrote down on the show notes here one called uh, – that's along those lines basically saying the supernatural beings and sorcery are not to be trusted. Now, you, you, the sorcery part is what you just mentioned. I think the supernatural beings one is also true. I, it's hard for me to Im- remember a character in, in, in any of the the stuff that we've discussed that has – that is supernatural that is trustworthy. <laughs> oh, yeah. I think those go hand in hand. Like, Well, like the big one is uh, Elric and Ariok and their relationship, for example. Right. Or, uh, or the or the two wizards uh, from the Fat from the Grey Master. Uh, yes, it was like Sheila the Eyeless Face and Ningabla the Seven Eyes or something like that. Pretty close, yeah. Uh, but they, you know, and and they were helpful, but they were definitely not to be trusted too far. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, I'm going to throw another one out there. I think uh, this is also common: is that if if you do gain prosperity and you're one of the quote unquote heroes of sword and sorcery, it is something that really never really lasts. You, yeah. can, you can come back from an adventure and be like, that was awesome. I have gold. I will be able to retire. I'm going to set up in the tropics. No, that's not going to happen. <laughs> Some, no. Something will come along and you have to you know, have to act. Now, this is something I was kind of curious about. Is it because, again, I'm new to the genre. Is it something where it's 
the bigger batter threat just over the next hill or is it more i killed the bad guy now there's a power vacuum and this other bad guy is coming in to take over what the other guy had well it can also be just you know you party like a rock star with all that gold you brought back and now you're broke <laughs> that's what uh faffer and the gray master used to do all the time the, uh, the 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 big defining characteristic of all those sword and sorcery stories uh or at least a, a great number of them is that they're highly episodic right that that you know uh, and it's because I think of the fact that the, the genre was born in, in short stories that appeared in magazines like Weird Tales and comic uh, books, et cetera, yeah. in comic books, right? That, that That's the format is, you know, it's like a TV show. You know, we're going to start with, you know, Conan's going to find hear about a problem or an opportunity. He's going to go deal with that. And then the story is going to end. And next week he's he's doing something else. <laughs> right. That, that it's the so it's really not the case that that. That people uh, get a chance to make a permanent long change in their character arc, and in fact, this is something else that people will tell you about sword and sorcery is that the heroes of sword and sorcery uh, tend to be guys who don't change a lot from story to story. Right? That's, There's that's, not a lot of character growth in Conan. He's the same guy in the 20th story that he was in the first. Yeah. Well, yeah, and, and that's that is definitely true. I think for a lot of characters, like Red Sonia, is still probably Red Sonia. Uh, <laughs> yeah. That I couldn't tell you for sure about Claudia the Unconquered. Um, now, Fafra and the Green Master did change, uh, but it was over a very, very long time. Those books were published over like forty years. So, right. Uh, you know, I think I think if the same author, if I think if Robert E. Howard wrote Conan for more than that time, he might have probably gotten actually some character development. Well, he ended up getting a crown, didn't he, by his own hand? Well, that's that's the story. You know, I, I'm not sure that I've actually read like that particular, like where he got that. I, th- I think that's what they were told. I thought I there know. were like King Conan stories. Are there? Oh, yeah, he, uh, he, he did. He became the King of Aquilonia. Okay. By you know, overthrowing a, a, an evil and corrupt uh, tyrant. But even so, when Conan was the King of Aquilonia, he was still Conan. <laughs> <laughs> well, and at the same time as those stories were being were coming out, they were also going back and saying, "Well, and here's a story from earlier in his history where he was not a king." Right. And, and this is going to be some place where I'm sure one of your listeners is going to call me on this. I don't think Robert Howard wrote a King Conan story. I think that the stories in which Conan had finally become a king were written by some of the other folks who came along later. And, and worked in the genre. Um, about the the latest Conan story I can think of would be maybe like, I want to say it's called like, uh, it's the one that it's like Drums Beyond the Black River or Drums Beyond the Thunder River or something like they that. Are. But the idea is that Conan is a is an officer in the army of Aquilonia who's fighting on the frontier against the Picts. Well, Wikipedia says there were five stories that were written by uh well, four stories that were written solely by Robert E. Howard, uh, one that was written by Elsberg de Camp, and one that was co-written between the two of them that were King Conan stories published in the 30s and Weird Tales. Ah. It's Jules of, I'm not even going to try to pronounce that, G-W-A-H-L-U-R, Beyond the Black oh, River. Oh, he wasn't a king in that one. Uh, All right. Label you know, as yeah. King Conan. Let's not get bogged so, down in minutia. <laughs> I'm, I'm trusting Wikipedia as a source on this one, man, so you if you win. read it on the internet, it must be true. I know, especially yeah. okay. so the Waller, I know pretty well, and, and Conan was... Conan was not a king in that one. Well, what we should do is, is definitely get like Mark Carroll or some of the other uh, Robert E. Howard fans that, that are that are super fans that we know and get him back on the show to talk about this kind of thing at some point. But let's uh, let's move on really quick. I think the, the only other thing I was going to mention about a theme or a trope is I, th- I feel like there's an instinct over reason trope that comes up an awful lot in Sword and Sorcery where you'll have a, a dilemma or something that, you know, can be solved with with reason or logic, but is more often solved via instinct or going back to your basics. Am I uh, wrong? It's certainly true that that Conan gets himself out of a lot of trouble by just being stronger and faster than other people. What do you think, John? Am I am I off base on that one? No, I think uh, that's valid because I think it's all knowledge is corruption. Really, um, I mean, <laughs> it, that's wow. what it boils down to. I mean, there not going to throw the word science around, but if there was, you know, an engineer building a pyramid, he'd be just as evil as that cultist or that he was working for or the wizard that was, you know, running the show. Well, I think that's true. And again, we're talking about that dial. I think if you, if you turn that dial to a certain setting, that's probably true. Not probably not true in all of them. Um, all of types of sort, but I, I see where you're coming from on that one. 
So let's leave behind let's leave behind this fiction stuff because we have gone over quite a bit, but this is really a show more about gaming. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about some game settings or game systems that are very sword and sorcery in in what they are or can be, I should say, have the potential to be uh, great sword and sorcery game systems or settings. Who wants to start us out? Uh, I'll throw one out. Uh, the Dark Sun setting. Aha. Uh-huh. Uh, obviously, uh, the second edition and uh, fourth edition in D anD D, um, Dark Sun is a very sword and sorcery world. Uh, magic is evil; it's in the hands of the bad of the wrong people. The world is populated by barbarians and savages. Yeah, you know, I think it's a I think it's a great example of a world that really embraces sword and sorcery tropes and does a lot with them. Very dangerous world. You have to be pragmatic to survive. And if you want yep. to know more about Dark Sun, we did a show with Timothy Brown all about that particular setting. So go check out go check out that particular show to hear all about Dark Sun. And um, researching Dark Sun is actually what got me thinking about jo- uh, John Carter of Mars was that right that was apparently one of the other big influences in Second Edition, according to what I read online. Again, so feel free to correct me, anyone. <laughs> no, that, that, that's true. Uh, uh, Troy Denning and, and Tim Brown were big uh, Barsoom fans and wanted to do D and D and. Uh, they wanted to do a version of D anD D that uh, a world of D anD D that had a lot of Barsoom in it. You know, if he was more of a diplomat, we we would have been calling him Jimmy Carter of Mars. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> okay, uh, that, I, I promise I'm done. So the next one I want to talk about is On Mighty Thews. Have any of you guys played this game? No, I have not. I have not played it either, to my shame. But uh, Mark Carroll told me all about it, and it's just a really interesting, amazing. Uh, idea of you're building the world at the same time you're building your characters like you'll get a piece of paper and you'll write down you know I'm playing uh, Lothar the Strong and you put that put strong down on the piece of paper in one of the corners you trace a you trace a line to the opposite corner you write weak you write down the opposite of whatever your character stands for and that's how you build the world is deti- determining how far away your homeland is from that other homeland things like that so really interesting stuff hmm. I'm probably I probably mangling it. I think, but that's what I recall from like what Mark Carroll told me about it. So I'm, I'm really interested on Mighty Thews, and I think uh, people who are interested in sword, sorcery, sword and sorcery should check it out. Of course, there's Primeval Thule, which we've been talking about quite a bit. Uh, Conan has been an RPG in uh, probably four formats at least. <laughs> I'm thinking New one coming out too. Yep. Well, I think I was counting that one, but um, so, somewhere around three or four different versions of Conan and yeah, RPGs. If I'm not mistaken, the first one was D and D, wasn't it? Most likely. Yeah, and then uh, Yes, I think so. So, yeah, uh, Gert, Gert's going in. a uh, D&D version of uh, uh, Lankmar. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. There's now a Savage Worlds version of Lankmar, which I am pleased to have said I worked on. Oh, awesome. In fact, Savage Worlds has the Savage World of Solomon Kane and a setting called Legends of Steel that are both uh, sword and sorcery. What are some other yeah, ones? That's, that's- we we like to actually uh, bring Thule to uh, the Savage Worlds engine at some point. It's just a matter of finding some time to do it. Oh, right. Hey, that would be pretty badass. Uh, as a Savage Worlds author, I would say, welcome. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's also Beasts and Barbarians for Savage Worlds. Oh, yeah. I hadn't heard of that one. It's fairly recent. Okay. Daryl? Again, not my category that well. I just uh, I kind of went to Wikipedia to look one up. Uh, one of them was uh, there's... Warriors and Warlocks, which was a sword and sorcery fantasy version of Mutants and Masterminds that was published by, I think it was, right. I believe it was Green Running that published that one. Right. Well, I'm going to throw one out there. I'm going to throw out um, Legends of the Flame Princess. Oh, how did I forget that one? <laughs> now, Legends of the Flame Princess uh, by James Raggi, it's, it's, it definitely, in my mind, has a sword and sorcery feel, but it's, it's at a certain point on that dial, too. Like, I think, I think playing Legends of the Flame Princess is probably more Conan, probably more Red Sonia, and probably not particularly, for example, Elric or Solomon Kane or Fritz, uh, or Fritz Lieber. Okay. Haven't played it myself. You mentioned Iron Kingdoms. That's certainly a great source for sword and sorcery play. Iron Kingdoms? I think it? you meant Iron Heroes. Oh, Iron Heroes. Sorry. Yeah, big difference. <laughs> <laughs> What's What's yeah. One of those Iron... has giant steam-powered robots. No, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, sorry. <laughs> no, I, I do think Iron Heroes is an excellent iteration of a D20 version of the game for sword and sorcery just because of the way that it's developed to kind of mirror a lot of D&D's paradigms, but at the same time, you know, explicitly, you're not really magical. So 
in this particular subgenre of fantasy, we've talked about what makes it interesting. We've talked about what makes it unique from a fiction standpoint, like what the themes and the tropes are. What about when you're running a game in it? When you're running a game that's based in sword and sorcery, what are the things you do to set that apart? Uh, well, certainly one of the things that I, I do, uh, going back to the idea of I want characters to kind of be more self-starting, mm-hmm. uh, is I, I try to look for ways to seed adventure ideas that the players bring to me instead of me assigning to the players, right? So rather than, than say, you've been summoned by Lord so-and-so who needs your help with something, um, I'll instead, you know, say something like, uh, oh, you've heard... You've heard tales of this great treasure that may have gone, uh, may be missing. Or a map has come into your hands that, you know, that, uh, that shows a location of, of a palace uh, that was, uh, you know, uh, had a, a legendary hoard of emeralds. And, and not even, even to the point where uh, if you can present several of those things to the players uh, simultaneously or allow them to kind of develop organically through the campaign so that the players are actually coming to you and saying, you know, hey, I know what we want to do. We want to go after those emeralds we heard about, right? That's kind of the that kind of gets the players in the right frame of mind for what they're trying to do with their characters, as opposed to being waiting to told uh, being waited to be told uh, how they're going to save the world. You know, the next time. So you're saying it's it's more it's looking for more proactive play. Exactly, sandbox. and it's a little more sand. Yeah, it's a little more sandbox and less adventuring paradigm. Exactly. Okay. What What do you think, John? I think that's absolutely right. Uh, starting from the strongly self-motivated player character is kind of a critical point. Um, the other thing I like to see is um, a world that has a whole lot of evil in it. You know, ample opportunities for the heroes to do you know, he- the heroes. Yeah, the player characters <laughs> to do things that might be evil but still makes them better than the other guys. Yeah, I saw this in a game of Legends of the Flame Princess that was actually at Genghis Khan where there was a fair amount of drug use involved, for example. And I was that's kind of where I was coming from. Was like That's not really the kind of thing you would see a lot in, in, uh, in other types of, of uh, sword and sorcery, but you would certainly see that kind of thing in, in a Red Sonja story or a Conan story. Um, and it definitely adds something that the heroes were expected to do in order to, to win. So you're talking about like darker themes. It doesn't. It's not quite dark fantasy, but it's it's a little. It's definitely grittier. You know, you're bringing in uh, some more morally questionable activities, things of that nature. Busting up a thieves guild instead of going to slay a vampire. Well, you might be taking over the thieves guild. <laughs> eh. If you're if you're the gray mouser, you might. Uh, <laughs> well, busting up one thieves guild, so your thieves guild takes more territory. It's a possibility. Okay. Um, another little thing that that I. Uh try to do is present the party with uh, a rival who is out for the same prize. Uh, just because that comes up so darn often in the Conan stories and, and the, and the and the gray mouser stories, it just feels like it's part of the part of the genre that there's always somebody else out there who's, who's trying to get there before the, the, you know, the, the protagonist does. What else can we say about sword and sorcery and, and gaming? We're talking about like things like antagonists and plots. One thing I've always thought of when I thought of sword and sorcery is it seems to be on a, a smaller scale in a way where it's usually instead of big epic fantasy where I'm going, I'm trying to save the world or save the kingdom. It's more like I'm trying to topple this one tyrant specifically. Does that sound like something? So you're talking you about, yeah, it's talking about scope. Yeah, basically. Exactly. Huh? Well, it seems he... to have more of a tighter focus on the bubble around the PCs as opposed to global focus. Or There's even a times that Conan points. has saved the world, I think, but uh, it's it's more by you know implication. Like if I don't fight this guy, he will eventually, you know, destroy the world. I don't well, know. And it's it's self interest too. A lot of times, you know, he's saving the world out of enlightened self interest, not because he cares about anybody else, but because oh, he's going to kill me in the process of killing the world. <laughs> well, yeah, but the point is that there the scope tends to not be that, I think, is what, what Daryl's getting at. Oh, yeah. yeah. The motivation isn't save the world, right. rescue the princess. It's kill the tyrant and get the princess so I can get my reward. Which is pretty much what happens in the Conan movie. <laughs> <laughs> Two snakes facing each other. Uh, Richard, what do you do differently for antagonists? Uh, differently for antagonists? Um, I think the question about scope is certainly certainly a good place to start, right? That you don't want someone who's you know, this guy is going to summon Tiamat, and Tiamat's going to eat the world. You want to, uh, a lot of sword and sorcery stories should be 
it should be very local problems, very, uh, very uh, things that are that are not global threats. You know, the antagonist should be a bit larger than life. That you know, sword and sorcery was born in, in pulp fantasy stories, and there's not a lot of subtlety in, <laughs> in, in the bad guys there. Oh, right? nice. Right, that it, it's okay to have uh, you know to have a four color villain. And, you know, why is this guy bad? You know, well, was it because he was, beaten, treat, you know, treated badly as a child? No, he's bad because he wants the thing that I want, and, and he's a murderous bastard. Here's, here's something I've always wanted to know. What is the advantage over using a hypnotized snake over a regular arrow? Well, the hypnotized <laughs> snake poisons you. Well, dip style. the arrow in. It's poison. all about style. <laughs> yeah, that's true. It's very stylish. Yeah, it's awesome. So, all right. If you're like shooting garter snakes at people, then sure, I guess it'd be about the same. But you know, so you know, it's like a cobra or something. <laughs> all right. So, our, we talked about antagonists and we talked about scope. What about plots? What do you do for the the, the plot of a game the, differently when you're doing a sword and sorcery? Well, one thing I'd like to mention is that I feel in order to stay true to the source material, it should be very, very episodic. Yeah, just like we were discussing. Right. I don't want an adventure to take two game sessions. That adventure is one game session and done. And, you know, I, the characters could be in a completely different place the next session. I don't need to have recurring NPCs. Hmm. You no, know, I mean, it can be very focused within the scope of that adventure. And then the next game session is, you know, like watching an episode of the A-Team. They don't necessarily ever see those same guys again. Interesting. You don't even necessarily have to narrate a whole lot of the what's happening with the player characters between adventures, right? I mean, you can you can say, well, you find yourself on the outskirts of the the Black City of Thrawn. Well, how did we get here? Doesn't matter. This is just where you are now. <laughs> Pay attention, right? This is this is you know when when the credits uh, you know when when the when the title screen comes up, this is what you're riding up to. Okay, and and now we're going to tell the story. So what is, how do you do that with a game where you're dealing with a lot of, uh, you know, leveling up and magic items and stuff like that along the way? You're, you're talking about sort of resetting the status quo. So obviously I think the players have to be in on that, right? Uh, a little bit. I mean, certainly like magic items, it can persist, you know, from adventure to adventure. Uh, although uh, we would even recommend, it depends on the game system you use, but um, there's no reason why you can't tell people, hey, you know what? Your magic items are not going to really matter. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to balance the game. Assuming that your party's magic light, you know, so you don't have to worry about you're going to be behind the power curve because you don't have your plus three sword yet. I'll I'll take care of that in my side of the screen. You know, if you just got a, a good a good trusty broadsword, you're okay. Well, that's very sword and sorcery too. Is that you shouldn't yeah. need a magic sword typically, yeah. as long as you have your instincts and your your trusty you know insert weapon of choice. So for example, Fafnir and the Grey Master, I think, almost exclusively use non non magical weapons. And I think if there is a magic weapon, it'd be kind of a character-defining thing. They'd only have the one like, sword. Like Elric, for example. <laughs> yes. Well, uh, we're running short on time for this particular episode, so I'm going to go ahead and segue into our final thoughts on sword and sorcery as a genre. And I'm going to start with John. What do you think your final thoughts are on sword and sorcery as a genre? I think it's a very powerful genre. I think there's you know just a multitude of different things you can do with it, but I think the most important thing going into it is making sure that your players are familiar and have expectations that are in line with what the game master intends for the campaign. Uh, because as you're talking about different game systems, different game systems have different expectations. And, you know, some of the games, you're not going to see a whole lot of character advancement. And within this setting, that's fine. Some of the games, you're not going to have a wizard or all wizards are going to be evil. And, you know, if one of your players is dead set on playing some kind of sorcerer, that could create some conflict. So I think the big thing is making sure you've got buy-in from everybody, that everybody's familiar with the settings, and that you don't try and disrupt the expectations too much. I mean, obviously, Game Master's going to need to rattle things a little bit to keep everybody on their toes and keep interest levels high. But I think the big thing is making sure everybody's expecting, hey, this isn't traditional D&D where I've got these five character classes. This is something that's a little bit different. You know, I'm going to jump in here. I think my final thoughts are that certain sorcery is a difficult one to get right 
because there's so many different flavors of fantasy. And if you want to keep that very specific feel for sword and sorcery, in my opinion, I think it actually requires quite a bit of genre reinforcement. And what I mean by that is I think you have to pick your specific themes and tropes that you want to highlight that are sword and sorcery and just really hammer them home. I think that's really important in order to keep it from blending into sort of that vast landscape that is the fantasy genre, you know, itself. If you want it to stand out as just sword and sorcery, I really, I, I think that the genre reinforcement is just a must. So that's me. How about you, Richard? I would say that the, uh, you know, it, it's kind of strange because for for something that is so foundational to the uh, to the fantasy RPG, right that. And if you look at like the very old original uh, Dungeons and Dragons uh, products and 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 the stories that are referenced like in that old appendix to the Dungeon Master's Guide, oh yeah, uh, you know like like half the inspiration in the game comes out of what I would think of as almost like the the sword and sandals genre, right? That yeah, you know half the inspiration for the game is Tolkien, but the other half is is Conan and and John Carter of Mars and things like that. But for whatever reason. It has been something that that very few uh, mainstream games have really have really wrestled with with presenting a, a good sword and sorcery uh, campaign or even uh, a whole lot of adventures. It's a uh, I guess it's because it, it's a trickier genre to pull off than you than you think when it's so easy to default to. Oh, okay, this is a world that's got elves and dwarves, just like you know, and this is a world where. You go and you kick open the door in a dungeon and, and kill a monster and take his stuff. Sword and sorcery stories tend to be a, a little more wide open, a little more th- theatrical, and and pulling them off does put a bigger burden on the DM. So you know, good sword and sorcery games need to help the DM, as you say, reinforce the tropes of the genre and and you know find ways to uh, to make an adventure feel like sword and sorcery, even if you're repurposing an old classic. All right. Uh, Daryl, what are your final thoughts on Sword and Sorcery? Like I said, when we started off, Sword and Sorcery has never really been my genre. And unlike a lot of the other episodes, I don't really think this one changed my mind, per se. I have a whole new appreciation for it, for its influences, for how far more broad it is than I originally thought it would be, both in doing the research and about talking about it. But I still think there's something about it that's just not my thing thing and that's not a bad thing not everything is for everyone it's just me personally sword and sorcery doesn't do it for me i'd be interested in trying to play a game in it because it seems like that would be a lot more fun than probably some of the fiction would be to me but yeah, i do have a new appreciation a new outlook on it but yeah it, well so it's important yeah. to remember is that sword and sorcery as a genre is foundational to the yes. history of not only the game but of a lot of uh, fantasy literature it's a very even if even if a lot of people don't find it compelling, and I would totally understand why someone would not find it compelling. Um, even if you don't find it compelling, I think you have to admit that it is very very important as a genre. Oh, that's absolutely no question about that. And it's even if it's something if you're like me and sword and sorcery isn't your thing, at least do a little bit of research on it to find out exactly how it influenced everything that came afterwards, how it influenced the tone of fantasy in general, and how it was doing something that was. In the especially in the 30s, completely unique for that genre that was also still drawing on old epic myths like um, Gilgamesh and King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table and all those sorts of mythology, Odysseus. Those some of those things were heavily influ- influential on sword and sorcery, and it carries over. It's something that you should really examine, even if it's not a genre that you want to read or play in. All right. So I'm going to throw it over to Richard Baker, and I would like you, if you would, to just tell our guests a little bit about what your latest thing is and where they can find out more about you, your stuff with the Sasquatches, and Primeval Thule on the interwebs. Uh, our, our latest thing, uh, the uh, we have two things going on pretty much almost simultaneously. First of all, of course, is uh, the new Elemental Evil campaign is launching for uh, uh, Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition uh, next month in uh, that's something we're obviously pretty proud of. The best place to find out more about that would almost certainly be uh, wizards.com. Um, and a- about the same time, we're going to be uh, uh, publishing our Primeval Fool campaign setting. Uh, it is available for Pathfinder, the 13th Age uh, role-playing game, uh, and the 4th Edition role-playing game. Uh, we had a very successful Kickstarter for that about a year and a half ago, and we're finally 
uh, getting our books out to everybody just this month. In fact, just today, I was uh, we received from uh, China uh, over seven hundred uh, seven hundred books at uh, at uh, Steve Schubert's house, and we were sorting through them. So uh, our Kickstarter backers are going to get those uh, in just a uh, hopefully not much more in a week or two, and probably by the time they hear this show. Yeah, it could be, and uh, and uh, our book will be uh, uh, in distribution and and released uh, for your friendly local game store. Um, to find out a little bit more about it, uh, I would say uh, come visit us at sasquatchgamestudio.com, uh, all one word, and uh, we'll have a little more information about uh, the Primeval Fool setting. Uh, I've got to ask, Richard, can you please tell us the name of your blog? <laughs> Actually, I've been kind of neglect- neglecting my blog a little bit lately because I've been so darn busy. Uh, but yes, my, uh, my, my blog is Atomic Dragon Battleship. The coolest blog name I think I've ever seen. <laughs> All right. Uh, John Dunn, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about where people can find out more about you and your latest thing. And one of your latest things, uh, if you're allowed to talk about it, uh, happens to be related to Primeval Thule. Uh Sure. So I did an adventure for Primeval Thule, which I think we'll be seeing a PDF release not too long after the print copies roll out. Does that sound right, Richard? Uh, yes. In fact, uh, I... Uh, we just have to get it laid out now. I, I already kind of did a good editing and development pass on it, and uh, made your words uh, shine. So, well, then <laughs> that's fantastic. That's Thank a you. very diplomatic way to say that I edited your product. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they will be far leaning far brighter than anything I could have done. That's very nice. I'm going to remember that when I'm s- sending back a manuscript for Shine Tar. We made your words shine. <laughs> uh, and I think uh, speaking of Shine Tar, there's also some stuff I worked on there that's related to Accursed as well. That's uh, right. On Darkest, Darkest Tides, Tides, which Meli Orvia will be publishing. I think we will be the first third party publisher of an uh, Evil Beagle Shine Tar product, too. Yeah, most uh, likely. And so that dovetails into meliorvia.com, which is the site that tracks any of the, my self publishing projects. Uh, primarily related to Accursed and Hope Preparatory School. And then uh, I think Fantasy Flight has Force and Destiny out in beta right now, and that is probably the highest profile thing that I've worked on that's at that kind of stage right now. Correct. And there's all kinds of great stuff that John and I are working on as well for more Accursed stuff in this pipeline. Absolutely. Yeah, we're, we're excited about that. Okay, uh, John, so familiarview.com is where we find out more about you, and we can also find out about Accursed. And if we want to see anything about your products, probably the best place to go is Drive Through RPG and just search for Melly or Via. Absolutely. Okay. I uh, should note uh, uh, Primeval Fools are available on uh, Drive Through RPG also. I should have plugged them before. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the reminder. Hey, no problem. <laughs> okay, Daryl, anything else you want to say about certain sorcery before we close this out tonight? Like I said, I, I seem like I'm a little bit down on the genre. It is a great genre. If it's something that you're even remotely interested in, looking on it. Uh, Primeval Fool, if you're on the fence, if you're kind of eh, about it like me, I've gotten a chance to look through it. It is an amazing product. Definitely check it out uh, because there's a lot more going on than just the normal sword and sorcery. Uh, it still stays true to the genre while in, adding in enough stuff to keep someone like me interested in it. So definitely check that out. All right. And it's gorgeous. Yes, it's it is. Tricky. It is. Yeah, it's Todd Lockwood. No, I'm sorry. That's somebody else. Um, who is the artwork uh, by? No, the, the, the cover is uh, Todd Lockwood. Is it? Okay. Then I was – okay. I was, I was, uh, my instinct was to say Todd Lockwood. Yep. All right. Well, until next time then, thank you all listeners and kick, Kickstarter backers for both Primeval Fool and Accursed. Thank you everybody for taking part in this particular episode. On behalf of Daryl and myself, we're both grateful to have John Dunn and Richard Baker back with us. Happy Thanks here. again for the opportunity. It was awesome having you guys with us. And that's going to close us out for the night. So until next time, may all your hits be crits. Well, that about wraps things up for this episode of the Gamers Tavern. Because this episode was recorded a year ago, I wanted to give you a little bit of an update. You may remember we did an episode about Lankamar a while back, and we recorded that episode after this one. So I've had a little bit more time with the sword and sorcery genre. In my opinion of it has changed since this recording. I didn't want to edit out what I said because I wanted it to stay there for historical reasons, but it, it's 
really still not my thing per se, but I'm a lot more open to it now, especially the more pulp inspired examples. Uh, Fafford and the Gray Mouser is a great series and I recommend looking it up. Uh, while I'm still slow about trying some other authors, because every single time I s- seem to get burned by stuff that goes a little bit too into the grimdark fantasy, and that is completely not my thing, despite my love of Game of Thrones. But I found that if I'm a lot more open-minded about these things, I'm finding a lot more good quality fiction out there and a lot of good games as well. I recommend doing it too if you've been a little bit reluctant to try Sword and Sorcery. There's also been a lot of gaming products coming out for the genre, like the Conan role-playing game, currently on Kickstarter. So if you're remotely interested in Robert E. Howard's work, even just as fiction, you might want to pick this one up because they've got a lot of Robert E. Howard scholars involved to make sure that it's authentic and is a good guide to the world of Conan. And it's already up and they're already knocking through almost all their stretch goals just getting started. Speaking of, I've got an update on some of our guests' projects. They were talking about things, again, that were in the works a year ago. Um, For Richard Baker, we've got the Elemental Evil book, Princes of the Apocalypse, that came out a while ago. And it's a really good adventure if you're looking for something that's pretty epic and a little bit unique for the recent stuff that's been coming out from D&D. It's definitely not just a retread of Temple of Elemental Evil, but a lot of those themes are still there. It's really, really good. I highly recommend it. It'll run you through uh, first through about 15th level if you run through the entire thing. Primeval Fool has also been out for a while and it's gotten a lot of positive reviews. There's also a new Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition version that actually went through Kickstarter and is now out now since this episode was recorded. And after the recording, it also appears that Atomic Dragon Battleship is now being updated more frequently than Richard made it out to be in the podcast. Accursed also has several more adventures and other products out, and they just closed a Kickstarter to expand the world of Morden. So look for more of those books coming out this year as well. I believe the first one, uh, Frost, Frost and Fang, I think it's called, uh, that's already out on drive through So go check those out as well. Uh, and again, you can find out more about that at meliorvia.com. So it's been actually a long time since I've done this, but I'm going to respond to some of the comments we've gotten. Uh, these are all from our website at gamerstavern.org. And the first one is from MRM1138. And this is on our superhero show part two. Another great setting I think would be a perfect RPG is Brandon Sanderson's The Reckoner series. It depicts a world in which people receive superpowers. However, whatever gave them their powers also made them evil. In short, it's a world of supervillains with no superheroes. The epics, as the supervillains are known, have taken over the world and turned it into a dystopia. The Reckoners of the series title are a group of non-powered humans who are fighting against the tyranny of epics. Not sure what system will work best, but I'm thinking something with a bit more narrative focus. I can't imagine regular humans would fare too well in an overly crunchy system. My personal choice would be Super's Revised Edition or Bash Ultimate Edition using the Extreme Earth Supplement for either. Thank you very much for that comment. Uh, It definitely sounds like a really, really cool setting. Uh, You could probably make that work with about anything, especially things like a Savage Worlds Fate would work really well for that, I think. Um, Hero System, again, is one of the most flexible systems out there. So you might end up getting crushed a bit if you try to fight them straight on. But again, you're talking about mundane people going against supervillains. So that's going to happen unless you have a crap load of Batman. But uh, there were a lot of games that we didn't bring up. I don't think we talked about Supers or Bash on the show uh, because on this one we did a part two. We wanted to talk a little bit more about the genre and how to play and run games in this genre uh, rather than just talk about all the different games out there. If you want more of that, that's um, what we did a little bit more of on our episode 23 was the first time we talked about superhero games. And then we've got uh, listener Arthur, who's actually been going through our backlogs and has been commenting on a couple of really old episodes. So thank you for going through those. Uh, the first one's from the per- first part of our D&D retrospective uh, from, I think it was from the from winter 2014. It was episode 11, Edition uh, Wars Are Bullshit, which again, I stand by that. Um, his comment was, I'm working my way through your back catalog of shows, but I had to take a minute and comment. I love Spelljammer. I own all the game books and novels. I feel like Spelljammer is D&D's pink mohawk. Thanks. Can't wait to catch up. You know, I never really got into Spelljammer myself. Um, it, 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 it's not anything against the setting. It's just that 
my friends were never into it when I was growing up. And there's been a lot of other settings I've really been more interested in looking into or playing. Like, um, really wanted to play fifth edition Ravenloft, which th- that's about to come out. Oh my God. Um, and stuff like that is something that's a little bit more up my alley than Spelljammer is. But I think that may be the best way to explain Spelljammer to someone like me is to call it D and D pink Mohawk. I mean, because for God's sake, you're piling magic powered sailing ships through the plains with giant space hamsters. That's about as peak Mohawk as it gets. Um, next up, Arthur went through and commented on episode 18, which was our mecha episode and was totally a genre episode. In my opinion, regardless of Ross, what Ross said when we recorded the podcast. Anyway, uh, Arthur said still chugging along and loving the podcast. There was no love for D and D and D 20 things like doom striders, dragon mech, D20 Mecha, Mecha Compendium, Mecha Morphosis, Transformers Knockoff, and finally Spelljammer had a mech in it, obviously, lol. I think the lack of D20 stuff is kind of twofold. Uh, the first is that basically I I personally never played a lot of the D20 stuff that came out. It, it was always during the D20 boom in the 2000s, it was always, hey, this thing came out. One person maybe buys it or we pick it up off the shelf at the game store and thumb through it and then put it back and go back to play D&D. There were a few good except big exceptions to that, obviously, but it was always D20 doesn't seem to fit this genre that well, so I don't know why they did that. But another thing is during the 2000s, there was a D20 version of everything. And a good chunk of that was actually forgotten shortly after it was released. And the ones that weren't, they had an uphill battle against the reputation of putting non-fancy stuff into D20 because the level-based advancement in D20 doesn't fit a lot of other genres that well other than the type of fantasy that D&D does. So usually when we do these shortest shows, unless we're talking about a bunch of games in the genre or especially if we're talking about something specific, we're we're probably going to miss a lot of those D20 games from the 2000s just because unless it was something that really, really stood out, it's not going to be something that really is something that at least I have any experience with. I can't speak for Ross. Um, Thank you, thank you for listing more games that people can go track down if they want to expand their mecha library a little, a little bit more. So um, I apologize, Mark, but I'm about to butcher your last name. But we have a comment on episode 55, our parody and homage games episode from Mark Buenlaz. Laus? Laus? Buenlaz? I am so sorry, Mark. But his comment. Hey, guys, I love the podcast and wait week to week for the new episode. But I had a few comments on your current episode. One, I believe the current edition of Hackmaster is fifth. Fourth Ed was the AD&D 2E parody. Two, I think Spycraft is more of an homage to Mission Impossible than to 007, since this is more team-related than a single person. My two cents, and where can I get news on Savage Rifts? Well, I actually double-checked after reading this comment, and you are absolutely correct, Mark. Uh, The new edition of Hackmaster is the fifth edition. It's the one I was talking about on the show. However, even fourth edition Hackmaster wasn't quite the parody game. It was kind of made out to be, or even I thought it was back in the day. And it looks like Hackmaster fourth edition was actually the first edition of Hackmaster that was publicly released because of the tie-in with uh, Knights of the Dinner Table at the time, they had moved to 3rd edition Hackmaster when 3rd edition D&D came out. So this is 4th edition Hackmaster. It makes sense in context. Um, but it was actually a lot closer to A&D 2nd edition, so you are correct on that as well. Because they even had conversion guides to update from 2nd edition AD&D to 4th edition Hackmaster. But the current 5th edition is a completely different beast from that. Definitely check it out if you're looking for something new that's kind of D20-ish, but not quite D20 system. Um, As far as Savage Rifts news goes, even though Ross is one of our producers, Gamers Tavern doesn't really have anything directly to do with Savage Rifts. So while we'll be reporting on it, we'll be talking about it a lot more when it gets closer to release. And we've got a couple of cross-promotional things that we're kind of working on, but that's down the way a little bit. The best place to find out actual real news on Savage Rifts is through Pinnacle Entertainment Group's website and Evil Beagle Games' website. We also got a comment about our Star Wars episode, which was a bit of an experiment for us. Uh, both Ross and I were itching to talk about the film in spoilerific detail, but not all of our friends had seen it yet due to 
different obligations. So we decided to record an episode to talk about it, uh, basically just so we could get it out of our system. But the episode's actually gotten a pretty good response, so you may see some more things like this from us in the future. Uh, and in case you haven't seen the film yet, neither the comment nor my response are going to have any spoilers in it. Uh, but this comment is from Tentacle Panther, who says... My favorite part of C-3PO is he's not just a comic relief character. He's one half of a comic relief duo. What makes that really great, uh, he's the straight man to the character that does not speak in any manner the audience can understand. I have to disagree with you on one of your points about Kylo Ren, which I'll do my best to keep spoiler free for the comment section. I don't think his most significant action is the turning point you make it out to be. I think that is him trying to force the issue, but his self-encouragement later on shows he didn't succeed, that he still doubts. That's not to say that I think my opinion is better than yours, that's just the way it looks to me. Okay, um, number one, for Ross, we say, force the issue. I had to do that because Ross isn't here to do it for me, so I'm going to groan on my own behalf. That said, um, I can definitely see what you mean about Kylo Ren. I just didn't read it that way. I think I went over this a little bit in the show, but it read a little bit to me like he was trying to override the pain from the injury. But that's, again, my opinion. We may find out what actually happened when the next film comes out in 2017. I obviously hope so, but we'll find out. Finally, we have a comment on our uh, posts about the Shadowrun game table plot resistance uh, live streams uh, we've been doing over on Twitch. Uh, there's a link on our website at gamerstavern.org for the archives, and we've been streaming starting this past week on both YouTube at youtube.com slash meet in a tavern, as well as on Twitch on twitch.tv slash gamers tavern show every Friday starting at 7.30 p.m. Central Time. And we're going to be adding more shows to the channel soon, so make sure to subscribe to keep track of that. Anyway, we've been releasing these as videos instead of audio podcasts, and this comment is from uh, Day 45 about those videos. Uh, Can you release these as audio as well? I don't have the time to watch videos this long, but I could listen on the commute and at work. Uh, This is something we've been looking at, but the editing process is really time-consuming on these live, uh, live table games because it takes about twice as long as just a normal episode of the show. I mean, I, I've got the raw recordings of the show, and I could release those straight off, but I feel really bad doing it because there's a lot of dead air time. There's a lot of people sorting out whether they succeeded or trying to decide whether to use Edge or not, sorting out initiative order, uh, just general things that happen at a table that are really break up the momentum if you're trying to listen to it as a podcast. And there's also sorting out, you know, technical issues that we have, like Skype's messing up or Roll20 issues, things like that, or if there's background noise. And you may think it's fine, but trust me, it will drive you nuts trying to listen to that as an audio podcast. Believe me. One thing I can recommend until we can get those cleaned up is there's a couple of apps out there that let you play YouTube videos from your phone or your other devices, even if the like you have the screen turned off, and that might help with your specific issue. But um, as far as the, as far as that goes, we're working on a solution for that, and hopefully we'll be able to start getting those out soon. But I can't say when for sure yet. Anyway, uh, that's everything for this week. If you would like to leave us a comment, you can like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash gamers tavern. Follow us on Twitter at gamers tavern PC as in podcast. Subscribe to us on Twitch at twitch.tv slash gamers tavern show. Subscribe on YouTube at youtube.com slash meet in a tavern or visit our website at gamerstavern.org. We also actually have a voicemail line now. You can call us at 512-910-GAME, G-A-M-E, and leave us a voicemail that we may play on air. That's 512-910-4263. And that is a U.S. number, so toll fees may apply depending on your location. Until next time, the tavern is closed. It's closed. Closed. It's 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 closed.